will rise us up as we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for who you are to us, a father, and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls. We thank you because of Calvary. Thank you for the great redemption at Calvary. And thank you because of the salvation you have given us, and for calling us to the ministry, giving us a work to do that even the angels are not given to do. And we thank you for the abiding grace, abounding grace, sufficient grace. And we pray, Lord, as we look into your word again, the way you raised up Paul the apostle to be a preacher, a proclaimer, a publisher of the gospel. We pray that that same grace and strength and power you give to all your ministers in Jesus' name. Make us faithful. Help us to be available. Fill us with your power and divine strength. That this work will prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. Strengthen the weak. Encourage those who are discouraged. And let the oil of gladness flow into every life and every ministry in Jesus' name. As you send us forth, we'll go in your strength. We'll go in your power. This work will prosper in our hands. Confirm it, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. I welcome you back once again to the study of the epistle to the Romans. We started with the first message last night, and then we are introduced to the writer of the epistle, inspired by the Spirit of God, energized by the power of the Holy Ghost to declare the truth of the gospel, not only to the Gentiles, but also to the Jews, and to really preach the gospel. He had to convince and convict the Jews to start with. And then the Gentiles also. Before he could present the grace of God. And so you find the plan of the epistle. And you find the outline and the outflow of this epistle. He talks first of all about his call. And then he talks to the church at Rome, praising God for them, for what God had done. And I was going to bring the gentle world in the true picture of who they were in the sight of the Lord. In chapter 2, he'll be going to talk about the Jews. In chapter 3, he'll bring all of them together, Jew and Gentile, and remind them and emphasize to them that all have seen and come short of the glory of God. At the end of that chapter, chapter 3, we'll be not talking now about the grace of God. You cannot talk about the solution without identifying the problem. You cannot talk about the love of God without talking about the Lord that the children of, of Adam had broken. That's why he started the way he started. And then he flowed through the way he's flowing through. He first of all mentions the writer Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Convicted Paul, converted Paul, called and commissioned Paul, consecrated and committed Paul, a conquered captive of the Lord Jesus Christ, and crucified. And also, he was the cross-bearing preacher. He compelled, constricted preacher. Constrained and consumed by the zeal of preaching the gospel, the good news and the glad story unto the Gentiles and the Jews. A contesting, contending Paul. Courageous, constantly concentrating. This one thing I do. And then he tells us from the very beginning, he wasn't going to preach the old covenant. 
He wasn't going to preach man's effort. He was going to preach the good news of the kingdom. He was going to preach the gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of grace, the gospel of godliness, and the gospel of salvation for the peace that it brings to us. And because of that, he was telling the Romans, he said, Although I'm sending this epistle to you, I'm writing to you, I'm planning to come to you. I've been praying about that. He prayed and he planned. And then he, he told them about his purpose. It was to come to strengthen their faith, to make them grow in the faith, and then it was to make them established and become steadfast. He reminded them, that is not just because they are inviting him or they wanted him. He was a debtor. And there was the debt that must be paid. And because of the debt that must be paid, they are taking a decision. And he said, now I'm ready to carry out that decision. I'm going to pursue this to the final conclusion. In education, he brought along. And he preserved that dedication to the end of the time because he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I was going to emphasize to them the peculiar doctrine of the new covenant. The peculiar thing they need to stake their lives on. The just shall live by faith. Who is the just? Can we be just in our own strength? Justified in our morals. Justified as Gentiles. Paul, can you tell us, in the Gentile world. Can you point to philosophers? Can you point to the great men in the Gentile world that are righteous by themselves and they don't need the cross and they don't need Jesus Christ? And then we can follow those philosophers. That's why I now wanted to tell them that the Gentile world is guilty. After that, the Jews will be saying, Paul, that's right. Those Gentiles are wood for eternal fire. Tell them they're guilty. They're condemned. And of course the gospel is not for them. It's for us Jews. And then he'll not bring the gospel to the Jews. But he'll tell them first, you're guilty also. You're without excuse. That leads us to what we're looking at today. We're looking at Romans chapter 1 verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God. It's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in righteousness. Then he goes on, and then in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that the which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. He was going to talk about the wrath of God. There are people that think only about the love of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the loving kindness of God, the gentleness of God, and then the father nature of God. And Paul the apostle said, yes, that's all true. But you need to think about God in his entirety, in his nature. There's also the wrath of God. Look at chapter 2 verse 2. In chapter 2 of Romans, verse 2, it says, But we're sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth. According to truth, it gives them that commit such things. It says, Don't think of a Father Christmas. Don't think of just love, love, love without the righteousness of God and the justice of God and the judgment of God and the wrath of God. Chapter 2, verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man? That thou that judgest them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Look at verse 5. But after thine hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath 
and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He assured them there is the judgment of God, there is the wrath of God. Look at chapter 11, verse 22. Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 22. It tells us in verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness of God on the one hand, and the severity of God on the other hand, unto them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. That's why, as we look at the remaining part of chapter 1, we're talking about escaping God's wrath. And there's only one way of escape. The way made by Christ through his death on the cross of Calvary. And there's only one way we get to that way. And it is by faith. Escaping God's wrath through faith. First of all, he tells us about revelation. Secondly, he talks about Rebellion. And number three, it talks about redemption. As you look at that uh, remaining part of chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, three things to consider. Number one, the revelation of the wrath of God. The revelation of the wrath of God. Number two, the reprobates under the wrath of God. Reprobates under the wrath of God. Number three, the redemption from the wrath of God. Number one, the revelation of the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He tells us about the revelation of the wrath of God. And he says, the, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the anger of God, the indignation of God, the punishment against sin is revealed. It's not revealed by philosophers. It's not revealed by moral men. It's not revealed by the governments of the world. It's not revealed by anything we see down here. It is revealed from heaven. And it's against all ungodliness and all the righteousness of men. And then as we begin to think, what does that mean? The unrighteousness of men. The ungodliness of men. He now tells us how to understand what it means when we talk about the ungodliness of men, the unrighteousness of men. Number one, look at verse 18. Who holds the truth in righteousness. It says there are people who know the truth theoretically, who know the truth in their mind, who can affirm the truth in their speech because they hold the truth. But now it says their character does not support the truth they hold. Their behavior does not support the truth they hold. It says, morally, you cannot tell that they hold the truth. Mentally, they do. Morally, they don't. Why? They don't have the love for the truth. They hold. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they received not the love for the truth that they might be saved. They know the truth, they don't love it. They know the truth, they don't decide to follow through. They know the truth, but they only decide to live by it. They know the truth. They don't decide to have the power, the grace, the strength to fulfill and to live in that truth. They do something to their conscience. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verses 1 and 2. First Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, listen to these, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They know the truth, they hold it in unrighteousness. It says, those are the people, and the wrath of God is revealed against them. Let's come back to Romans chapter 1, and we're looking at uh, verse 19 and verse 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it to them. Whether they are Gentiles or Jews, in their mind, in their hearts, He has revealed the truth unto them. Gentiles get married. How did they get married? Because it's in their hearts. God put that in their hearts. It's not good for a man to be alone. They may not be Jew, they may not be Jewish, but then they know marriage is good. And Gentiles, when they get married, they promise and they expect faithfulness one to another. How? Because it's in their hearts. I love you, love me, you are faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. Uh, Gentiles, they establish business. And in their business practice, they want uh, honesty. And they want to put you there, don't steal my money, I'll pay you your deal. All those things sign their hands. And Gentiles know the parents should love their children. Children should love their parents. Gentiles know that we shouldn't steal from each other. If you steal my property, then you deprive me of the use of my property. What should be known of God is known in their hearts. But look at this for the invisible things. Verse 20. Of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. They are without excuse. You see, the Gentiles, Abimelech was a Gentile. And then uh, Abraham had said that Sarah was his sister. And so Abimelech went and took Sarah. And God came to him in the dim by night and said, You are a dead man. Because the woman with you is another man's wife. He was a Gentile. He wasn't of the stock of Abraham. He wasn't a Jew. And it was in the Genesis period before the time of the Lord of Moses. And then he said, God, obviously a righteous nation. I wouldn't have taken her. He told me she was a sister. And God said, yes, I know. And because of that, you are gentle, I have prevented you from touching her. The point is this, those Gentiles are without excuse. Somebody might say, I've never been to a church where they talk about a righteousness. It's in your heart. Somebody might say, I've never been to a church where they, talk, where they say that killing another person is wrong. It's in your heart. You want someone to kill your wife or kill your husband or kill your children. And because you want not want that, it's written in the heart. And so they are without excuse. It also tells us, look at verse 21. It's describing the ungodliness of man. The righteousness of man. Because that when the new God... They glorified him not as God. They knew God. How did they know God? They knew God as creator. But they didn't look up to him and praise him as creator. You didn't create your child. You gave back to your child. You expected love and honor and faithfulness from your child. You know that God created you. They knew him as creator. And yet they didn't, oh, they didn't honor him as creator. They knew him as eternal, eternal. Wiser than men that are just living now. They knew him as eternal. They didn't go to him to ask for the knowledge that will make them live as they ought to live. They knew him as almighty, almighty. All those unbelievers, all those Gentiles, they knew God as the almighty. But then they didn't respond to him as the almighty. They knew him as king. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. They knew that he is the ruler, the governor, the king over this world. And they were not subjected to him as subjects are given unto their king. They knew him as judge. In their own locality, although they were Gentiles, they had prisons. Didn't you see the prisons where they put Paul the Apostle? That's the prison of the Gentiles. Why did they put them in prison? Because they knew that there is a, a way a, a person in the government, a person in the kingdom should behave. A person in 
in the empire should behave and if he didn't behave that way there was a prison to sign them and they should have known that god is king and god is judge and because of that they should have honored him and known that he too has a prison he'll put the people that are rebellious they knew he is holy that's, that's everybody knows that god is holy god is righteous and god cannot do evil and they should have known that holiness only is what will please the lord they knew him as the most high but they didn't honor him reverence him fear him as the most high they didn't glorify him accordingly look at that verse 21 again it says in verse 21 because that when the new god they glorified him not as God. Neither was thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. That's why they are ungodly. And it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. They profess wisdom in folly. The profess wisdom in folly. Look at verse 22. It says in verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man to birds and uh, four-footed bees and creeping things. You understand that? Uh, when uh, little children begin to go to school and the little children are told to draw, then they draw a picture of daddy or they draw a picture of mommy. And then uh, the teacher says, go and show daddy at home, go and show mommy at home. And then the child comes back and says, daddy, look at your picture. And daddy looks at that and laughs. Because uh, there's no resemblance at all between that picture and the father. And this is what the Gentiles have done. They, they know there's God. He's mighty. He's holy. He's the most high. He's the king. Is a judge. He is eternal. And then they draw a caricature of something like a bird and they say that's God. Comforted bees and they say that's God. The things, the creation of their own mind and the creation of the of, of uh, the earth here, they put that as God. How can a creature represent the creator like that? And so in their wisdom they became false. First Corinthians chapter three. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is reaching, it takes the wise in their own craftiness. Romans chapter 1. Ungodly, unrighteous, they had unclean habits they dishonored their own bodies between themselves verse 24 chapter 1 verse 24 wherefore it says god gave them up to uncleanness through the laws of their own hearts and to dishonor their own bodies between themselves they begin to do some unprintable things, unimaginable things in abomination and uncleanness with their bodies. Men and men and women and women and men and women and women and men. And it changed the truth of God into a lie. We're looking at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen it says that uh, these uh, gentiles what he did was to change the truth of god the truth of god they cannot that they mutilated that they changed that they turned it upside down and eventually became a lie but looking at uh, jeremiah chapter 13 jeremiah chapter 13 watch the Gentiles did, and what Jews eventually did, and what people of the land, what they have done, changing the truth of God into a lie. Jeremiah chapter 13, reading from verse 25. Chapter 13, verse 25. This is thy Lord, the portion of thy measures from me, says the Lord, because because thou hast forgotten me and trusted 
in falsehood changing the truth of God into a lie in Amos chapter 2 reading from verse 4 Amos chapter 2 reading from verse 4 talking about these Gentiles and of course it eventually affected the Jews themselves Amos chapter 2 verse 4 Thus says the Lord For three transgressions of Judah And for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof Because they have despised the law of the Lord And have not kept his commandments And their lies have caused them to err After which their fathers have walked and eventually they became guilty, verse 25, of Romans chapter 1, of worshipping the creature more than the creator, serving the creature more than the creator, fearing the creature more than the creator, obeying the creature more than the creator, trusting the creature more than the creator, loving the creature, more than the creator that's what it means for this it says uh, who change the truth of god into a lie i worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever we're told in second timothy chapter 3 verse 4 second timothy chapter 3 reading here from verse 4 the people of this generation what did you Chapter 3, verse 4, 2 Timothy, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We'll come back to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against all unrighteousness. It's because of this that the Lord now brought the judgment against them and leveled guilt, condemnation against the people of the world. We're coming to the second point now, the reprobates under the wrath of God. That they rebelled, that's one thing. That they remained in that rebellion and they addicted themselves to those evil things until, look at verse 24, look at what God did eventually. Therefore, God also gave them up, reprobates. Therefore, God also gave them up. Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, gave them up. They were reprobates. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not retain, like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. He gave, he gave them over to evil. He gave them over to their abominations he gave them over to all the evil things the chosen they will do we're looking at jeremiah chapter 6 jeremiah chapter 6 is possible for a man a woman to continue doing something evil something sinful something ungodly something unrighteous and the spirit of god wants him and wants him and wants her and wants her and yet he will not understand and yet she will not yield until god now says my spirit shall not always strive with men for he is flesh reprobate is given up we're looking at jeremiah chapter 6 verse 30 reprobate silver shall men call them reprobate silver shall men call them because the lord has rejected them let's come back to romans chapter one and look at these uh, people now the gentle world and the sinners also in the world today and see what the lord has done and see what has become their lord number one reprobates abandoned number two reprobates addicted 
Number three, reprobates afflicted. Number four, reprobates are pathetic. Number five, reprobates abominable. Number six, reprobates associated. Number seven, reprobates are poor and accursed. Number one, reprobates abandoned. Look at Romans chapter one, looking at verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the laws of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies, and between themselves. Verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for the even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Verse 28, and even as they did not retain God, like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, abandoned, abandoned. Does that ever happen? Yes, it happens. It can happen to an individual, can happen to a family, can happen to a community. In Osea chapter 4, reprobates abandoned. Hosea chapter 4, we're reading from verse 17. Hosea chapter 4, verse 17, reprobates abandoned. A frame is joined to idols, let him alone. Preacher, let him alone. Prophet, let him alone. Counselor, let him alone. Rulers and kings, let him alone. That's a nation. Ephraim, Israel, is joined to idols. Let him alone. God gave them up. Number two. Reprobates addicted. Addicted. As you look at those verses I read already, look at verse 24 again. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the laws of their own hearts. They have become addicted. Addicted to evil. Addicted to lawlessness. Addicted to abomination. It say, and that's the reason why God gave them up in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 17. There are people who become addicted, addicted to drugs, yes. Addicted to immorality, yes. Addicted to the wine, addicted to alcohol, yes. Addicted to occultism, yes. Addicted to wickedness, yes, addicted. Reprobates, addicted. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19, who have been past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. To work all uncleanness with greediness. Like the Sodomites abandoned themselves, addicted themselves. To the evil of their day. Jude verse 7. In Jude verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The ungodly. The righteous, the reprobates, abandoned, addicted, number three, afflicted. Welcome to chapter one of Romans, verse 27. The latter part in particular, but let's see it from the first part. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, bond in their lust, one toward another. Men with men walking that which is unseemly. Look at this. And receiving in themselves in their body. HIV AIDS. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now they were afflicted. 
Their sin brought sickness. Their sin brought suffering. Their sin brought sorrow. Psalm 107 verse 17. Psalm 107 verse 17. Fools. Because of their transgression. And because of their iniquities are afflicted. Fools. Because of their addiction to evil. Addiction to abomination. They become afflicted. Number four. Reprobates are pathetic. Are pathetic. They've grown thick skin. And nothing penetrates. They have the scales of a crocodile. On the spiritual moral skin. And arrows of preaching. And the darts of quotations from the Bible. And the piercing sword of the word of God does not penetrate anymore. In Romans chapter 1 verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. It says God gave them up to reprobate mind. Look at this. To do those things which are not convenient. And they don't feel it. They are apathetic. Their conscience has been seared as with the hot iron. As we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Reprobates abominable. 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 They become abomination to the Lord. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 29. Being filled with unrighteousness. Filled with all unrighteousness, filled to the brim. You look at their lives, and all you can see fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. They'll argue it to the last point why nobody can be free from all those abominations, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Even if a kind of sin had not been, uh, you know, in town, they invent it. If a new invention comes, like the internet, they'll think through on how to project internet crime. And they're always thinking, always bringing up one form of evil or the, or the other. Disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable or merciful. It says they become abominable. They become abominable. It tells us in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. It says, for the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, all mongers, and sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I pray God will set us free. Thank God we are free. Somebody there says, thank God you are free. Number six, reprobates associated. You think that reprobates will not have any association, but they have to have association to encourage each other, to nail each other into that thing, and to make them keep in that addiction. They are associated. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure, they encourage, they lift up, and, and they even teach others have pleasure in them that do them. Number seven, reprobates are forged, and reprobates are cursed. Who know the judgment of God, that the which commit such things are not, worthy, are not only worthy of death, but... They also have pleasure in them that do them. We're looking at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And here we're reading from verses 59 to 62. Psalm 78. Reading from verse 59. In verse 59 it says, When God had this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. 
so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh and the tent which he placed among them and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth in it with his inheritance. Psalm 106. In Psalm 106, verse 39 and verse 40, thus they were defiled with their own works, these reprobates, and went a warring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, in so much that he abhorred his own inheritance. Psalm 9 verse 17 some 9 verse 17 it says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God any way out yes the way of redemption we come to point number 3 in Romans chapter 1 verse 7 Romans chapter 1 verse 17 rather for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. As it is written, everybody is unjust. The gentle world addicted to evil. The gentle world abandoned in their evil. The gentle world afflicted for their evil. The gentle word apathetic, abominable, associated, abhorred, and accursed. But there's still a way out of that wrath of God. And it is the way of faith. It is the way of faith. Habakkuk had already signaled that many years before. And I told them, if you are going to escape the judgment of God, there's only one way. And it is by faith. The Jews had that. They didn't take note. The Gentiles should have heard. Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 4. Behold, a soul which is lifted up, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. The people who take pride in their morality. The people who take pride in their religion. The people who take pride in the works of their hand. Look at what I am. Look at what I am. And yet the reprobates, it says, they are so lifted up in them. It's not right. It's not upright. But the just shall live by his faith. That's the way of escape. And eventually Christ came. He made that way clear. That believing on him... For the work of redemption he will do. Because it's the only way out of sin, out of damnation, out of perdition, out of eternal judgment. Believing in him will get us out of the wrath. John chapter 3 verse 18. John chapter 3 verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 36 He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not have life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. The only way of escape. The only way of freedom, the only way to be free from that curse and from that judgment and from that wrath, indignation, anger of God is the way of faith. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 5, we're looking at verse 8. It tells us in verse 8, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commended his love. Towards us in the midst of wrath, he has mercy. And he says, Whosoever will take this provision, propitiation for our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, his atonement, his sacrifice, his substitution, his salvation, he'll escape the wrath of God. But God commendeth his love toward us. 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, much more than, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, or are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Thank God there's a way of escape. I say thank God there's a way of escape. And that's how you have escaped, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, forgiving your sin, turning you away from iniquity, separating you from the gentle world, and separating you from the judgment, the wrath, the indignation, the anger that comes upon the unbeliever. And now he has given you the message, you're free, go set other people free. You know the way of truth, go tell the truth, the gospel truth to all the people. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3, Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past. In the laws of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were by nature children of wrath, even as others. How did we escape? Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, and for his great love where with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Verse 8, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now he tells us, now that we are saved, our lives need to turn around. And the grace of God is there to make sure that we are not like we used to be. Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are born, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. What steps will the sinner take? What steps have we taken? And what part of the steps are we still continuing to be taking so that we we'll have this redemption, full redemption, free redemption? Final redemption. Number one, recognize the immutable righteousness of God. Recognize the immutable righteousness of God. It's his nature. He cannot bring himself to love evil, to love sin, to tolerate sin. Immutable, unchanging. Recognize that. Number two, reflect on the interminable wrath of God. Reflect. Reflect. You've heard that wrath of God is interminable. It will not terminate. It's unending. Reflect on that. Think on that. As uh, you see the people of the world, and as you see them going from sin to sin, iniquity to iniquity, abomination to abomination, reflect on the interminable wrath of God and do something about it. Lead them to repentance, and you yourself, if there is any kind of unrighteousness there, number three, repent of your insensible rebellion against God. How can you see fire and run into that fire? Insensible. How can you see a pit and run into that pit and break your bones and die and perish? Insensible. And then look at your friends and look at your neighbors and they are rushing on and they are by the edge of the cliff and they can get in there anytime and perish. Flee. 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 It tells us in First Corinthians chapter six, verse eighteen. First Corinthians chapter six, verse eighteen. Don't go from the life of sinning to rebellion 
to reprobation to being a reprobate. In chapter six, it tells, chapter six, verse eighteen, it says, "Flee fornication." Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body, against his own soul, against his own destiny, against his own goodness. He that committed fornication sinneth against his soul. Chapter 10, verse 14, flee. Chapter 10, verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 22. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 22. It tells us to flee. It says in verse 22, flee also youthful lost and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. First Timothy 6, 11. But thou, man of God, how do you even become a minister, man of God? And thou, woman of God, after you become a great leader in the ministry, but thou, man of God, woman of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Number one, recognize the mutable righteousness of God. Number two, reflect on the interminable wrath of God. Number three, repent of your insensible rebellion against God. Number four, reckon on the immense riches of His grace. His grace that reaches far, far to everyone. Reckon on that. Whatever you have done, wherever you have been, come plunge in the blood of the Lamb. Have faith in His sacrifice. Faith in His substitution. Faith in his sufficiency. And now, number five, receive the imputed righteousness of God. Receive the imputed righteousness of God. You have no righteousness of your own to start with. And then you come to him. And as you come to him, you believe. And he imputes his righteousness unto you because we're told in Romans chapter 4 verse 3 Romans chapter 4 verse 3 for what says the scripture Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him imputed unto him for righteousness imputed unto him for righteousness receive the imputed righteousness of God in Psalm 32, reading from verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. In no spirit there is no girl. Number 6, renew irreproachable righteousness toward God. You come back to Calvary. He cleanses you. He purges you. He washes you. And you renew irreproachable righteousness. Saying, now that I'm cleansed, now that I'm forgiven, I'm going to move on in a kind of righteousness that even the heavens cannot reproach. Renew irreproachable righteousness toward God. Number seven. Rescue impenitent rebels for God. They are rebelling and the Lord is sending you out, sending me out, sending us out to go and rescue them before they perish. They were impenitent. Assure them if they will repent and believe, he will forgive. 
Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Have mercy on them. Tell them Christ has died. And if they will come, he will receive them. Rescue the impenitent rebels for God. The Lord is calling us to the path of faith. Faith in Christ for salvation. Faith in Christ for grace. Faith in Christ for sanctification. Faith in Christ for righteousness. Faith in Christ for strength, for ability to do all that he has called us to do. He's calling us from one level of gray of faith to another higher level of faith. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The justified shall live by faith. The regenerate shall live by faith. The sanctified shall live by faith. The servant of God shall live by faith. The called and commission shall live by faith. All we need to live the life of faith is available. It says, come and receive. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Come and receive. Come and receive. Recognize God's immutable righteousness. Reflect on God's interminable wrath. Repent of your insensible rebellion. Recognize and reckon on the immense riches of His grace. Receive the imputed righteousness of God. Renew your commitment. Renew your consecration. Renew your absolute surrender. Renew that irreproachable righteousness to our God. And commit yourself to rescuing the perishing. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.